If you can see the picture on the right, uh, you will notice that it is the image of a cast where two preparations have been done. One is on a premolar and the second is on a molar. What I want you to do is look carefully at the margins of this uh, of this cast or the uh, prepared teeth. Now, what you would see is that a part of this uh, model has the margins exposed very well. For example, in this area here. And on the mesial side, you will find that the gum seems to be covering up the margin. Even here on the mesiopalatal or mesiolingual surface, the gum seems to be covering up the uh, margin. Now, what happens when we have made an impression like this or a model like this and we've sent it to the lab? Now, your technician is going to look at this and he's not going to be able to make out where is the margin beginning and where is the gum ending. So, if you're looking at the distal surface of this premolar, you are definitely able to make out the difference between the tooth margin and the gingiva. Whereas on the mesial surface, that distinction is not clear. So your technician is going to be working on a guess. He's going to just, uh, based on his experience, if he's very well experienced, he'll be able to figure out where the margin is lying. If he's uh, uh, having lesser experience, he's not going to be able to make out anything. And he could either over trim or under trim the cast. Uh, when he's ditching to expose the margins. So what would that do to your model? It would eventually, uh, sorry, what would that do to your prosthesis? You would either get a crown which is short or you would end up getting a crown which is seated on the gingiva. Uh, if you were here yesterday uh, when we were discussing on um, uh, the crown preparations, uh, before we started, I had given you an example of what happened when I had just gotten into practice and I used to work with a lab where they just could not understand what was needed. Um, uh, you know, they, was, they used to end up giving me crowns. Each and every crown used to lie on the gum. So probably that was the concept that they followed. They just eliminated all margins. The entire uh, gingival part of the cast was uh, cut off. And that's where they ended up uh, giving the margins, which is not going to be accurate. In both cases, whether you get a short margin crown or you get a crown which is seating on the gums or the gingiva, you're going to end up with disaster in a few months or years. Now, this brings me to the question on why is retraction important? Uh, we do talk about uh, gingival retraction and you know we've all read about it in our college days, but not many of us really follow it because uh, maybe somewhere we feel that you know, it's not important. Our technician would still be able to see the uh, margin or he has some um, you know, superpowers where he could probably see through the cast into and find the uh, margins. Um, unfortunately, that's not possible. And so uh, the retraction procedure becomes important. Now, what exactly are you trying to achieve by this retraction? You're just pushing away the gums in order to expose the margins that you have created around the tooth. You may say that I create only equigingival margins. I don't do subgingival margins. All my margins are usually visible. Uh, you may be right, you may be correct. But again, when you're making an impression, if you don't have a very thick margin, it's very difficult to find the difference or the distinction between the gum and the tooth. So, whether you have an equigingival, supragingival, or a subgingival preparation, please ensure that you do retract. It hardly takes any time. I'm going to talk about certain techniques which are going to make it much simpler to do the retraction. Um, how much retraction should be there? There should be at least 0.2 mm of gap that is created between the tooth surface and the gum so that your impression material can penetrate that area to record the area beneath the margin without getting torn. Now, what are the methods of gingival retraction? This is a purely textbook. You have mechanical, mechanical, chemical, there's several methods. Some of them are newer methods like expassel, uh, magic foam, tissue goo, and the more recent 3M retraction paste. Now, the most common and the most popular method of retraction remains the retraction cord. And uh, it's quite technique sensitive. And this is the reason why people don't prefer to do it. First of all, it is 
time consuming it's painful to the patient it's also painful to the dentist who's sitting and replacing the retraction cord inside and eventually it could lead to bleeding and a whole lot of other problems so people prefer not to use the retraction cord now the uh, while it is very popular the disadvantages include rapid collapse of the sulcus once you remove the uh, retraction cord you do have to leave the retraction cord in place for at least 7 to 8 minutes that's the minimum time that is required for the retraction cord to push away the gingiva for some time the moment you remove it the gingiva starts collapsing on itself uh trauma to the epithelial attachment is very common um somebody who is new to retraction may not know where to stop and may end up pushing the uh retraction cord in too deep which could harm the epithelial attachment which later on could lead to the gingiva migrating um uh, further apically instead of covering up the margins well also um it does not provide you with a hemostasis solution so if you have bleeding gums it could be because of your preparation while you have been prepping you could have injured the gums or while pushing in the retraction cord you may have injured the gums and it could lead to bleeding unfortunately unless a retraction cord is impregnated with an external chemical it does not have the capability to uh, allow for hemostasis also very time consuming there's a risk of sulcus contamination if any of the uh, chemicals are used and it is very painful to the patient so when you're pushing in the retraction cord it actually hurts the patient if you're going too close to the attachment so all of these reasons are uh, you know something which deters dentists away from doing it and frankly speaking nobody actually feels that it's an important step that needs to be done now according to literature a gingival retraction agent should be effective enough to create a trough which is free of blood fluids and it should not damage the gingiva at all so when we think about the retraction cord uh, it is very very technique sensitive you could end up going through the biological attachment also the contours must be predictable and tissues should recover in a considerable period of time now if you have gone ahead and uh, damage the attachment chances are that there would be a pipal migration of the gingiva which could lead to your gingiva getting recess and eventually your crown or the processes that you're giving the margins of that may actually uh, not match what they were initially so um again the use of a retraction cord becomes questionable in 1977 uh, dr rajshekar s added two more criteria as to what a retraction agent should be doing and he said that it should not be toxic to the patient and it should also take minimal chair time now uh, when you have finished your crown prep it usually takes at least half an hour to 45 minutes to do a single crown preparation and then you have the uh, impression to make and you have the uh, temporization to do and cement the temporary crown now in that period of time you if you also have a 10 minute uh, time period for gingival retraction i believe it's quite irritating and uh, you know you would like to shorten up uh, shorten out that time and that is why there were newer materials that have been introduced uh, to improve the speed and the efficacy of gingival retraction these are both materials that i have used uh, myself in fact uh, some of these are my own um uh, cases which i had done long time back now this on the left uh, was a material called as expasil which was a paste which could be injected into the sulcus you leave it for a few minutes and then you wash it off and make the impression so this paste used to go inside the sulcus and it used to uh, absorb the moisture and expand so it had hemostatic properties the problem with this was that the tip of this uh, um, material was quite thick so if you had a tight gingiva the chances were that the material would not penetrate the sulcus and you would be left with a lot of material outside the sulcus which would efficiently not allow for any retraction so you would have uneven gingival retraction this similarly uh, magic foam is a material which is still available today now um, what i experienced with this was uh, this was a much simpler and a much easier way of using uh, 
or doing retraction. But what happened was that this is a silicone based material. So it's something like your light body, which you are injecting into your sulcus. And then you have to stabilize this with a copley cap. So basically it's a, a, a thick piece of cotton roll, which is uh, designated for a particular tooth. You place it and ask the patient to bite on it. And when the patient bites, this material goes into the sulcus and it sets and that's what causes the retraction. However, these compre caps or these caps that were available were not customized. They were made according to a single size and in one area it would allow for penetration into the sulcus while in the other areas the material would still remain outside. So again, we ended up with uh, uh, uneven gingival retraction. So the people went back again to using the retraction cord. However, very recently, uh, there has been uh, introduction of a gingival retraction paste. Now, this is very similar in chemistry to the expassel that we saw in the previous slide. Now, this contains uh, a paste, a material of uh, kaolin and aluminum chloride, which acts as a hemostatic agent. And the best part of this is that the tip here is very, very thin and very, very uh, atraumatic. So all you need to do is ensure that the tip goes into the sulcus, inject the material around the sulcus. So it's a blue paste like this. Leave it on for just two minutes. So within two minutes, this material is going to allow for absorption of moisture, expand and allow for hemostasis. You wash it off and here you can see that the gingiva has been separated away from the uh, tooth for a small amount of time. And this is when you can just go in and record your impression. Now, uh, one of the questions that uh, you know comes into people's minds who've been using the retraction cord is, you know, that would this give you as much retraction as a retraction cord? Uh, the answer is no, it doesn't, but it gives you enough retraction for you to make an impression and separate the gums away from the tooth. You do not require the kind of retraction that a retraction cord would give you. Secondly, this also allows for hemostasis. It is atraumatic to the patient. The patient doesn't feel pain and the chances of you uh, uh, going through the biological attachment are almost next to nil. So once the gingival retraction has been completed, we need to move on to making the impression very quickly. Now, uh, we spent a lot of time discussing yesterday on, uh, you know, what grooves we need to create and, uh, uh, you know, we need to do a buckle uh, uh, a bevel and, you know, a palatal bevel and all of that we discussed yesterday. Now, all of that, uh, comes to life only if you are able to capture it in your impression and finally on the model because it's your technician who's going to be doing all of this work. So the importance of impressions cannot be given any more importance than this. I believe that even if you've done a bad prep and you made a good impression, you will end up with a decent, good, uh, long-lasting restoration as compared to a beautiful prep but with the impression not uh, you know, really very great. Now, um, most times uh, what, what I see people doing is that, uh, you know, they would have a certain system of making their impressions and retraction and all of that. But people tend to experiment a lot. Sometimes it's because of the uh, cost or somebody would give you a slightly better offer or, uh, you know, you would, you would just come across with a better material. My advice and uh, my experience is stick to what works for you. Stick to the procedures that you've been doing. And this is part of the success simplified concept that we were talking about yesterday. Uh, if you've been working with an impression material for maybe three or four years and you've been getting great results, don't change your material to something else just because it's probably uh, 500 rupees cheaper than uh, uh, another material. Stick to the materials for predictable results. Um, probably you'll not be able to see the effects of what you are doing uh, immediately. But over a period of time, you know, you will, you will find that uh, some of your cases have been very successful and some of them have not been not so successful. At that point of time, it's very difficult to recollect what is it that you exactly did. So the advice here is stick to the procedures that you're using, stick to the lab that is giving you a good result. 
Now, while there have been a lot of uh, uh, technological advances in uh, uh, CAT scan systems and you know uh, making digital impressions, I think scanners are the next big thing in dentistry. Uh, a lot of dentists are uh, uh, going in for scanners, even though it's it's quite costly. But uh, there's several people who are investing into it because it's definitely next level. It gives you the ease. You can get rid of you know your uh, impressions, carrying that impression to the lab, disinfecting, all of that gets completely negated away. And the accuracy seems to be much higher as compared to an impression. However, uh, there are several cases still where an impression remains an integral and an irreplaceable step. For example, where you are giving uh, subgingival margins, it's very difficult for a scanner to access those areas. Also, areas with difficult access, if you are making a crown on uh, upper seven, probably it would be difficult for you to scan that area as compared to an anterior or a premolar area. So uh, these are some of the differences. Plus, uh, uh, if you have bleeding, it's very difficult to uh, record. You probably have to send the patient away and recall him uh, uh, next day to record the margins and record the impressions digitally. So these are all shortcomings. These are still challenges that remain. And uh, truly, we're looking for uh, better and better options as we are going ahead. Now, uh, uh, at one point of time, I used to support a lab, as in I used to provide uh, technical support to a lab. And uh, uh, I used to go uh, five or six times in a month. And I, I used to uh, you know, watch what was coming in into labs. And, I was really surprised at the kind of impressions that uh, used to come into the lab. And this is not only in India, we find this problem worldwide. Um, there was uh, uh, you know, a lab, uh, several labs that were uh, surveyed and they found that 90% of all the impressions that come into a lab, to labs in US, do not have their margins recorded. So, uh, you know, that's like a big, big sum of uh, restorations which are lying probably just in the air. They are not lying on a tooth or there's no positive stop for the crown to really uh, sit on something. And that is one of the biggest reasons why, you know, we end up with failures in our crowns and failed restorations. And sometimes we don't understand that, you know, we did everything good and how did this restoration fail? Or sometimes we blame our patients, probably the patient was eating something very hard or he was chewing on bones. But the real reason is in the techniques that we follow. Now, what could be the main challenges that we face when we make impressions? There are several steps to this. So we, we just saw that we should be doing a retraction step in order to record uh, uh, the, um, the margins well. Uh, tray selection is tricky. Uh, you should record, you should have adequate space for your impression material to spread around. Um, if you don't have adequate space, so at least two to three millimeters of space on either side of the prepared tooth, you should have space for the material so that the material can compress and come back to its original shape. And impression making as such also uh, is, is, quite technique sensitive, we're going to discuss each of these steps a little ahead. Uh, it also depends, the accuracy of your impression also depends upon the material that you're, you're using for making the impression. Some of us work with uh, VPS material, some of us use C silicones or polyether, while some of us still believe in alginates as the uh, material of choice for crown and bridges or um, uh, you know, even more technique sensitive restorations. Now, uh, when it comes to impression materials, like I said, if something is working well for you, please stick to that. Um, if you're looking to change your impression material, if something is not working for you, what is it that you should keep in mind when you are looking out for a new impression material? I'm sure there are several people from different companies who come around to your clinics and tell you that, you know, we have this material, which is, uh, uh, you know, this is uh, got these properties and, you know, you have uh, another material, which is probably some somewhat cheaper than the one that you're using. But there are four properties which you should keep in mind and probably something that you should test out before you actually go in and purchase the material. The first is how hydrophilic is the uh, impression material. Now, by hydrophilicity, I mean that when your impression material is coming into contact with 
water or moisture or blood does it have a tendency to pull away from the moisture or does it go and hug the moisture and spread around the moisture area that's very critical because most of the times we are not able to control the fluid generation around prepared teeth imagine a lower 6 or a lower 7 which is pooling in saliva how much ever you try and isolate it you would still have moisture if nothing else there's gcf coming out and you can't make impressions under a rubber dam so you have to rely on the properties of your impression material uh, now there is a small test to check how hydrophilic your material is i'm going to show that to you a little later but do test whether uh, your material is able to flow around well or not most of the vps materials that are available in the market are hydrophobic which means that they do not spread very well around water and there are certain surfactants that are added into these materials to make them more hydrophilic the problem is that that surfactant takes some time to appear uh, on the surface and make the material hydrophilic that takes a few seconds and by that time your material is already beginning to set so does the material ever become hydrophilic is a question that we all should ask ourselves especially in a hot country like india where most of the time the temperatures are above 35 degrees uh, more, these materials are made to uh, stay in room temperatures below 25 degrees or below 23 degrees for forever and when you are exposing them to such high temperatures chances are your setting time gets compromised it starts to set faster and that's where your hydrophilicity question really comes into picture the next property is tensile strength so your material should have the strength to come off from the mouth without tearing in the critical areas or in very thin areas now what do i mean by this now we saw when we are retracting the gingiva away from the tooth you are looking at a 0.2 mm of space to place your impression material into the sulcus now 0.2 is like really thin it's paper thin uh, it's probably transparent you can see through that material so when you are placing it into the patient's mouth and you are pulling it out with a jerk your material should have the strength to withstand that force and should not tear in those critical areas otherwise the uh, information that you've got is incorrect and sometimes you can't see you really can't see these are uh, these in that thickness the material is usually transparent or translucent and you cannot see that you know probably a part of it has is torn and it is lying inside the sulcus a uh, 100% recovery from elongation now all elastomeric materials have a tendency to expand over undercuts and they should come back to the original form at least that's what we expect that our impression materials would expand and come back to the original shape um however the best of the best materials do not come back uh i think the best material comes back to about 99.8% so you've already introduced a 0.2% of inaccuracy there okay this is the best material that i'm talking about some of these materials come down to 97% and 96% so there is a 3% inaccuracy that is already introduced into the into the impression and higher dimensional stability this is um uh, of course a, a given now that uh, we do not uh for our casts in the in the clinics we send them to the lab uh the reason being that our impressions are dimensionally stable the vps ones especially are dimensionally stable for above a month and you can pour, pour those impressions multiple times now more or less these four are the impression materials that are available in the market and uh, are used by dentists you have alginate condensation silicone a silicone which is nothing but vps and you have polyethers now let's take a look at a uh, comparison between these three materials because um, usually people feel that you know alginate works very well it 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 gives me good results and you know i'm able to record my margins well so i don't need to shift to a rubber based material but look at the properties here now if you look at all those four properties that we did uh, discuss dimensionally alginate is completely unstable we know that it has the ability to uptake water and 
uh, lose water. So unless the casts are poured really uh, quickly, you would end up with inaccurate casts. Something for all of us to think about. Uh, most of the times we make a rubber base impression for the prepared arch, but for the opposing arch, we make an impression with alginate. And more or less, most of the times we end up with high points on our casts. Now on the model, uh, we see that the, uh, you know, there are no high points. Our technicians also place the, uh, uh, the crown on the cast and they check for high points. But the moment you put it in the patient's mouth, the patient says, it's high. I'm feeling that there is something. And then we start the reduction. Um, you know, one of the reasons why this happens is because we are using the alginate material for the opposing arch. As an experiment, try the same thing with a VPS-based material for both the arches and then see if it makes a difference to, your, uh, to the accuracy and how your high points behave when you've made impressions with VPS. Uh, in terms of tear strength, it's quite poor. You cannot pour it multiple times. Long-term long -term storage is not an option. The only positive thing about this is that it is hydrophilic. If you compare... See silicone, again, the only advantages that you see here are they are hydrophilic and you could pour them multiple times. Whereas the VPS material gives you all of these various advantages that you are really looking for in an impression material for critical areas. Now, even under VPS materials or elastomeric materials, there are so many options. As you can see in the picture here, some of these materials are uh, quite stiff. So they are standing up and you can see these peaks. Whereas some of them tend to slump and even in the slumping ones, some of them are slumping lesser while some of them are completely slumping. So there are so many materials and what do you decide? How do you decide what is it that you, that you want? Is it about your personal preference or is there something that uh, uh, depends upon the technique that needs to be followed? So um, again, there are so many options and it's quite confusing for the dentist on what to choose. So the first rule of thumb is that follow those four principles or the four properties. Uh, make sure that the materials that you are considering fall uh, well in those four different properties. Um, now, this is a chart that has mapped different impression materials according to those four properties. And uh, the closest impression material that comes to a diamond is what is best in terms of all the four different properties. So uh, this is self-explanatory. You could, you could just see it for yourself. Uh, some of these materials are very good in some properties, like the orange one here seems to be very high in terms of dimensional stability as well as recovery from elongation. But it scores very less on the hydrophilicity angle and on the tensile strength. So it has low tear strength and it is not hydrophilic at all. Whereas some other materials, they are very good at hydrophilicity, are quite decent in recovery from elongation, average in dimensional stability, but tensile strength remains very poor. So try to chart out these uh, uh, in materials according to the uh, properties of the materials. Now, uh, the one from 3M is my personal favorite. I've been using it from my uh, post-graduation days. Um, my guide introduced me to this material. And um, before that, I've used several different uh, uh, light body and putty materials. And it used to be a nightmare, especially, uh, um, you know, for... Uh, uh, putting the light body onto the putty, I had to use the pressure of both my hands sometimes to extrude the material. Whereas this was quite easy. It used to just flow out as soon as I pressed the gun, the material would start flowing out. Also, it gives you about 18 degrees of hydrophilicity or contact angle, which makes it very, very hydrophilic as compared to all other um, competition materials that are available. Now, this was a, a fun test that I did with my impression material, and I would urge all of you to, you know, sit in your own practice and try this out. You could also do it at your house. So I'm just sharing this, uh, uh, you know, video. This is one way to test whether your impression material is hydrophilic or not. So uh, this was done on a five rupee coins. Uh, we place it in a bowl full of water. So you can see that it's completely submerged in water. And here I take my uh, light body gun.
okay i'm extruding a little bit of the light body uh, this is a practice that should be done every time a new cartridge is used you bleed the material and there you go the uh, impression material is being applied please note that the tip always remains in contact with the material the moment you take the tip out of the material the chances of introducing an air bubble become high okay now we are going to wait for this material to set and uh, uh, here we go the material seems to be completely set and let's see what happens so can you see the imprints of the 5 rupee coin completely captured on the uh, impression material along with those small vines and flowers and leaves are also completely captured now this is completely submerged in in under water and uh, we can see that this is the level of uh, detail reproduction that we are actually looking at so uh, a small experiment for all of you to do tomorrow with your own light bodies okay moving ahead um how do you select an impression tray uh, now in covid time my advice to everyone would be to use metal trays um instead of using plastic trays the reason being a metal tray can be autoclaved a plastic tray cannot be autoclaved so try using more of your uh, metal trays uh, you could choose between a perforated or a non perforated tray the option is completely yours but uh, try to use a tray adhesive every time that you are making an impression and this is again something that i have learned uh, through experience um sometimes what used to happen and this is uh, something that i realized over a period of time um i used to make impressions they used to look beautiful beautiful margins captured it used to go to the lab the crowns used to come back and the crowns didn't seem to fit and this was even despite i making temporary crowns immediately cementing it i just couldn't understand what was happening and then one day i just turned around my impression to check what what you know whether there was any mistake in the way i was recording my impression and suddenly when i turned it around i saw that uh, in maybe four or five holes of the perforated tray the impression material had separated away from the tray uh, so what had happened is when you uh, apply some pressure to remove the impression from the mouth under that pressure in certain areas the impression had separated while on the whole it it appeared to be stuck to the impression tray but in certain areas it separated and unfortunately for me it was in the critical areas and that was the reason the crown was not fitting in so um, i realized from then onwards that uh, applying tray adhesive you can just apply it in a very thin coat but it's important to keep your impression stuck to the impression tray now this is something that we see very very often in labs uh the impression has separated away from the tree now the dentist may not realize what would happen but the fine crown that you want to get is not going to be able to uh fit into the tooth onto the tooth now um there are different ways of making impressions you have one step you have two step and you have monophase impression techniques now again is this based on the preference of the dentist or what he is comfortable with or is it indicated in certain conditions now uh, you have uh, you have two ways of using the vps materials and elastomeric materials either you hand mix them like here you have a, a hand mix putty along with a light body or you could choose to use an automatic mixer now this is something which has become very relevant in uh, covid times um something that again i have used extensively and i can vouch for the fact that uh, not only in terms of hygiene but in terms of the mix of the material uh, uh, the homogeneity of the material and the accuracy of the material an automatic mixer would be much better it also gives you a longer working time so, so you know when you're working on uh, long span bridges or uh, uh you know you're recording an impression for the full arch this uh, making an impression with an automatic mixer would just give you that little extra time for you to be able to 
inject the entire light body and putty and make your impressions. Now, uh, this is the Pentamix. It's available in various different models. I'm not going to get into the details, uh, but uh, you could use it with two different types of impression materials. You could use it with BPS as well as uh, polyether impression materials. Now, when it comes to making the impressions, two techniques, you have a single stage technique and you have two stage impression techniques. Now, the single stage is what is most preferred, especially in in cases of single crowns um, or maybe short bridges, short span bridges, if you have up to three units or maybe even four units, it's okay to go with a single stage technique. The reason being that here you have to apply the putty as well as the light body in the unset stage. So um, at least for me, I need an assistant while I'm doing this technique. Uh, this is called the one stage putty wash technique. So what I do is once the tray is selected, I'm just giving you my own experience and what I do. Um, I'm going to allow for isolation of the, uh, uh, of the prepared tooth and ensure that it is dry. And then my assistant starts mixing the putty. Um, in the meanwhile, I'll ensure that the tooth is dry as much as possible and I start injecting the light body around the tooth surface. In the, in the meanwhile, my assistant would hand me the tray with the material, uh, with the putty loaded on it and just remove the, uh, the extension tip from the light body gun and I'll just inject a little bit of material on the putty on the tray and then I place it into the patient's mouth. Now, this is very, very critical. So many times uh, my putty has started to set. Uh, sometimes my light body, which is in the mouth, starts to set. So you have to be very, very quick around it. And like I said, uh, in India, it being very hot, the setting times get compromised. You don't really get very long setting times and get very short working and setting trained. And uh, you and your assistant have to be very, very quick. Sorry. Okay, so this is something, uh, you know, where you have up to three to three teeth is maximum where you could go in for a single stage putty wash technique. Beyond that, I would not uh, really advise it. And what really happens in a putty wash technique? Let's let's take a look at this impression here, where you can see this blue putty as well as the pink light body. Now, what has happened here is when you have used the putty and the light body in an unset condition, the putty being more viscous tends to push away the light body or the light body tends to get displaced. Now, fortunately for us, this gets displaced into the, uh, into the margin area and the critical area, which is the marginal area, gets recorded in the light body. And that's what we want to achieve. We want that our uh, critical details, our uh, crown preparation details should get recorded in light body. So this is what we achieve while we are um, you know, going in for this. Now, uh, coming to the consistency of the materials, what, what is it that we would like to use in the one stage technique? Now, I would like to use a putty which is soft. I would not like to use a stiff putty in case of a single stage impression technique because the stiffer the material that is going to be, the more the displacement of the light body. So I don't want that the entire light body is out of the tray and the impression gets recorded in putty. So my choice of material here would be a soft putty with a regular light body. Now, when I come to the two-step putty wash technique, now this is the uh, method of choice when you're looking at long span uh, restorations, maybe you, know, you have six veneers uh, uh, preparations that you want to make impressions for, or probably you have a full arch uh, uh, FMR case where you're looking to make a full arch impression. Now, in all of those cases, a two-step putty wash technique would be more suitable. Now, in terms of accuracy, it has been found that both the one stage as well as the two stage uh, impressions seem to be equally accurate. So we, we know that accuracy is not an issue. It's just a technique based on the, uh, uh, the setting and the working time of the material. So here, now what I do, I'm, going to, I'm just going to explain uh, my own experience around this. And this is something that I have learned uh, or during my post-graduation days. So for making the two-step uh, impression, you first need to make a putty impression or a putty index. So basically, you are customizing your 
uh, stock tray in order to have a uniform light body uh, uh, on the impression, on the final impression. So what we do is we apply some wax either directly onto the teeth. This is a two layer wax either on the teeth or if you have a model, you could adapt it to the model. Now place this sheet of wax. It's only up till the level of the teeth. You don't want it coming up to the gum level. It's only covering the teeth. Uh, you place it and you load a tray with putty and you place the putty over it. Now, when the putty sets, it's going to come out something in this form. Now, this wax needs to be removed. And because this was almost a uniform thickness of wax, you can just go ahead and directly inject your light body onto it and place it in the patient's mouth. So eventually you're going to get an impression where the entire detail is going to be recorded in light body. Now, sometimes what people uh, uh, or doctors try to do is they would try to scrape off the material, uh, the putty material without placing a spacer in between. Or maybe the spacer could be a, a plastic sheet which where you could still be able to see the tooth indentations. Now, what happens in such cases? Um, so it means that your putty is not in uniform thickness and the light body that you're going to add is also going to be not uniform. Now, remember that every time you're going to place the tray in the mouth, pull it out, there's going to be some amount of distortion. You want that distortion to be um, uh, uh, similar each and every single time. You don't want that uh, your putty should be distorted more as compared to the light body. Secondly, when you're going to pour the cast and pull it out, there's a second time that the distortion is going to take place. So um, please ensure that you have a uniform thickness of the light body uh, in order to get accuracy in the impression material. There is a third technique of making monophase impressions. Uh, now, this is something which is picking up. Uh, these are usually polyether impression materials. Now, if you could see this impression, there is no separate light body or a separate putty. Uh, it's the same phase of impressions. Um, uh, you just work with the same material in two different forms. So here you have uh, the pentamix extruding material directly onto the tray. And then there is a syringe as well, which you can use to uh, inject material around the teeth. And when you use both of them together, you would end up with an impression which would look something like this. Advantage of this is the, uh, uh, the impression is far more accurate because you don't have two different phases which are acting differently. The putty acts in a different way and the light body tends to act in a different way. Your, both of them are the same phase and they are far more accurate. Secondly, these materials are hydrophilic. They're intrinsically hydrophilic. So you don't have to worry about uh, you know, surfactants and the material is setting. So the moment it is touching the tooth, it starts to flow around the tooth. So here you could see a comparison between polyether and uh, VPS materials. Uh, one of the uh, issues that people usually complain about with polyether is uh, the rigidity in the material and um, it's difficult to take it out from the mouth once the material is set. Personally, I have not faced a single issue till today uh, around, around this. The reason being that I'm very vigilant. The moment the material is setting, I just go ahead and I remove it. But apart from that, in terms of flowability, in terms of hydrophilicity, uh, it scores much higher as compared to the VPS impression material. Uh, this is a clinical case where you can see preparations that have been done and an impression made with a monophase uh, polyether material. Now, what I want you to note is the small feather-like extensions that you can see on this uh, margin. Now, this is exactly what happens when you are doing a retraction of your gingiva. So if you have retracted your gingiva well, you will find that your impression material is going beyond the margin. It's going into the sulcus area and that part gets recorded as this very thin feathery margin. And, uh, uh, you know, this is what is going to separate uh, the tooth from the gingiva on the cast. So this is this is extremely important. So uh, this is something that you should be seeing on all of your impression materials. So we, now we are completed. Uh, we finished our impression, and uh, the next step is to send the patient away. And um, 
recall him for the final cementation or on the day of the final cementation now this is something that uh, you know I, i started doing once i came out of post graduation i uh, uh, during post graduation it was mandatory for us to make temporary restorations and send every patient with a temporary we had to also uh, record each case and take photographs so it had become part and parcel of of our practice but once we came out into um, uh, into general practice um the places where i worked i was encouraged not to waste time on doing provisional restorations and eventually you know that became a, a a habit where you know you would just send the patient unless it was a vital prep or it was an anterior prep you tend you tend to send the patient away and then have them come in on the day of cementation but the what i started finding was that the day of cementation was becoming more and more of a horror story so i you had to trim the crowns from uh, the proximal there was a lot of uh, uh, high points that you could see and it just caught me wondering that you know i i never really faced these issues while i was in college um so again you know you would you would tell yourself that you know it's okay probably the lab is changed and the lab is not doing such a great job and so on and so forth so one one fine day i decided that from here onwards i am going to make temporary crowns for each and every patient irrespective of the clinical case and i took it up as an experiment and what i found was it made life very very easy in during cementation so this is again a, a tip with personal experience i have seen myself what difference it can make to your crowns now let's understand uh, what happens to your crowns if you are going to have uh, uh, you know to uh, trim the crowns proximally and if you going to you know really um, uh, uh, trim it off and make the surface rough you've lost your contacts you've lost the finish that you've given your crown your crowns have now become a pocket of plaque retention a uh, pocket of food uh, lodgement and so on there is no way you could get that accuracy back that your lab has made and given to you so it's it's kind of a compromised restoration so this is the reason why provisional restorations are are important if you make them you would realize how beautiful your final restorations are going to be now what are the different options for making temporary crowns um the most preferred option is sending it to the lab uh, you make an alginate impression pour a cast and send it to the lab uh, while it seems to be a quick option and it seems to be uh, uh, an easy option i feel uh, now in hindsight i feel that it is more time consuming and it is irritating for both the dentist as well as the patient reason being you are making an extra impression you are going to pour it in stone you are going to have a lab person come in and pick it up uh 12 to 24 hours later you're going to have him deliver that crown to your clinic you will have to call your patient back make him sit on the chair again spend about half an hour to trim and cement the crown and send the patient back so these are the issues that you know you would you would face apart from that aesthetic seem to be quite good uh, you get quite uh, fair aesthetics with it especially if you have heat cure crowns made but the fit of these crowns could be an issue uh one of my one of my own cases i remember i was uh, making a, a crown for a lower 7 which which had a very minimal crown height and we had done a a crown lengthening for that tooth and i wanted to preserve the position of gingiva at any cost so i went ahead and uh, you know got a crown made by a lab immediately and i placed it in the patient's mouth and uh, the patient came back to me within 12 hours in the evening and she had the crown in her hand um you know so i thought okay maybe this is a uh, uh, crown height is too short so let me try and cement it with gic and uh, you know it will stay anyways she was an implant patient and i could place the final crown only after 3 months so i went ahead uh, uh, mix some gic placed it and the patient was back again after 12 hours with the crown in her hand and then i thought now what to do and uh, you know i tried resin cement but each and every time i got the same result uh, the crowns tended to come off and um, i i had a lot of issues with that case i'm going to follow up the story later to tell you what i eventually did but i'll hold on for to this right now uh the second option for uh, uh, temporary crowns are chair side self self cure acrylic crowns 
Um, so this is easy to make in the clinic. You don't need to send it out to the lab. The only problem is that you would need to make an extra impression and an extra uh, cast. Um, and you would have to make your patient wait for a long period of time. Um, along with the irritation of trimming uh, the, the, the crowns that you're going to bring out. So what you do, you start off making a putty index when, you, when you're beginning the case. Um, once uh, your preparation is over, you make a cast of the prep teeth, use the initial putty index, place the acrylic material in that and place it on the cast. The disadvantage here is that this acrylic cannot be placed directly in the patient's mouth because of the monomer content and because it is heat releasing, which could damage the teeth. So this is the reason why it, it is kind of an irritating procedure. This is something which we used to follow in college for each and every patient. But in practice, it has not been a very preferable method. Uh, in terms of fit, it's, it's quite good. You get good fit. You get a good amount of aesthetics as well. But over a period of time, my material of choice for making temporary crowns has turned to bis acrylic materials, which are chair side uh, uh, temporary crowns, which could be fabricated directly in the mouth. It takes me only 10 extra minutes to fabricate this crown and cement it in the patient's mouth. Um, you also don't need to polish. You don't need to spend a lot of time in finishing and polishing. These are strong. They are long lasting crowns. Um, they also are very, very aesthetic. Now, indications for these, you could use them for all your crown bridges, inlay, onlays, veneers, as well as long-term temporizations. So when you're looking at, uh, uh, you know, provisional crowns for implants, you're looking at FMR cases, you could use these crowns as, or this material as long-term temporaries. Now, this is a follow-up of a case uh, where the pro temp crowns have been placed for five years. Um, so, you know, it, it, it gets you to think that, you know, for patients who cannot really afford uh, maybe aesthetic crowns, this could be a good option instead of giving patients metal crowns. The fit is impeccable because you're making it directly in the patient's mouth. You don't have to worry about trimming the intaglio surface of the crown. It lasts for a long time. It doesn't fracture and it gives you good, fair aesthetics as well. Now, these are some clinical cases um, where, uh, uh, you know, the bisacrylic pro temp material has been used for creating temporary crowns. So this was a, a complete upper jaw where a wax up has been done. So the picture number two is a wax up. Now, this is followed by a putty index that is created. So you don't need light body here. You just need putty. If you're doing, um, uh, you know, just a single tooth or probably an FPD, a three unit FPD, you could just use a sectional tray like I did yesterday before the preparation of the tooth had started. Now, once this is done, all you need to do is inject the uh, pro -tem material into the uh, putty index and place it directly into the patient's mouth. Once it is set, you remove it, you trim off all the excess and you can just cement it in with a temporary cement. So it, it, it is very, very quick and it's a very, very simple method to follow. Now, another case where uh, there was metal showing and obviously once the crown has been removed, you cannot send the patient back in this way. Usually you will wait for some time till the lab is able to send you the crown. But if you have this this acrylic material in your clinic, you can just go ahead and make a crown immediately and send the patient. Now, what I've started doing is I make a temporary crown for each and every patient of mine. Uh, even if the patient has come with a previous crown prep, what I do is I just inject some of this uh, pro temp material all around the tooth and I ask the patient to bite and we wait for the material to set and trim off all the excess and that becomes a crown for the patient till the final crown comes in. Now, how do you, uh, how do you uh, finish off this pro temp restoration? Like I said, you don't need to finish and polish. Just wipe it off with ethanol swab. So you can take either uh, an alcohol swab or you can dip a cotton piece in alcohol and just wipe it off. It removes the extra resin and then you can just go ahead and cement it with a, a Rely X temp any cement or any other uh, temporary cement for that matter. Now, this is a small uh, video that uh, you know will show you how to create these bisacrylic crowns uh, chair side in the patient's mouth. Now, this is being done on a model. So um, just let me try and play this for you.
So you could use this for all your temporization needs. Just inject a little bit of material before you start placing it. Now, if this is a vacuum form sheet, you could also do the same thing with the putty index. Now, on the prepared tooth surface, on the putty index, you're going to inject material and then place it, place the putty index back over the, uh, over the teeth. And then you wait for this material to set. It usually sets in about a minute. So you get your initial set, then you pull off the matrix or the putty index. Wait for about five minutes till the material completely sets. Okay, so the crown is here. All you need to do is wipe it off with a swab of alcohol. And there you go, it's, it's ready to be cemented in the patient's mouth. So I'm going to skip the cementation process here and we'll just move on. Okay, now once you have cemented the temporary, you don't have to worry about whether your patient is going to come back in two days or two months or two years. It doesn't matter. Whenever he does, your final crown is going to be lying ready uh, for him to be placed in the patient in, the, in his mouth. Um, Okay, now let's come on towards the cementation of uh, crowns. Now, yesterday I had started talking, when, when we started this discussion, I started talking about uh, how long crowns are supposed to last. So I've got the statistic for you. Um, PFM crowns are supposed to last uh, 10, over 10 years, at least there should be a 92% survival rate. And over 15 years, there should be a 75% survival rate. This is, this is through actual cases. For zirconia, over five years, 93% uh, survival rate. And for all ceramic FPDs, the survival rate over five years is 89%. Now, we see that there is a sharp decline. From 92, it goes down to 75 within five years. And the reason for this is attributed to material fatigue, uh, of the restoration is, and the luting agents, recurrent caries and retention loss. Now, all the last three factors are based on the cementation. At least well, that's what I believe that the chances of the cement getting fatigued or recurrent caries starting or retention loss are all based on how well you cement your final prosthesis. Uh, one of the reasons why you would have recurrent caries after you have placed a, a final crown and cemented it permanently is because your cement continues to dissolve. So uh, research has moved towards bringing better and better cements. We've moved away from uh, conventional GIC cements now towards uh, much stronger and more aesthetic resin cements. And uh, this is also based on the need of the restoration. So there are so many different processes you see on the picture. There is a PFM, there is an all ceramic. You can see some veneers, you can see some inlays, onlays. So what is the cement that you should use for each of these methods? Is it one cement or you have to use a combination of, a cement, of cements? Let's take a look at this. Now, when you classify cements, you classify them, uh, you start from the GIC category, which is the basic uh, classification or the basic cementation material that is available. And then you move towards resin modified GIC, self-adhesive resin, and finally adhesive resin. And we see that as we are moving towards the adhesive uh, cements, we see the bond strength as well as the aesthetics keep on increasing. And I want you to see uh, how the bond strength changes as we move from conventional on GIC cementation to adhesive cementation. Now, what cement or what kind of cement is indicated for which type of preparation? Now, if you are using a, a full, or if you're making a full uh, retentive crown or a full coverage crown with a material like PFM or zirconia, you could either choose to use conventional GIC cements, RM GIC cements, or you could use self-adhesive cements. But if you're making a crown, a full coverage crown with glass ceramics or hybrid materials, which are lower in strength, then you immediately start off with adhesive cements, that is resin-based cements. Then you do not have the option of going towards the uh, conventional GIC cements. 
Similarly, when we are looking at non-retentive preparations, for example, inlays, onlays, veneers, these are preparations which are um, in place because of the type of cement that you're using. You start off directly with adhesive cements. Now, this is again based on the material. So, if you're doing an inlay with a metal, metal, uh, uh, if you're doing a metal inlay, you'd want to cement it in with a, a, a self-adhesive resin cement. Um, if you're doing a, a zirconia veneer, again, you would want to go in for a, a complete adhesive cement or a, at least a self-adhesive cement. And when you're working with glass ceramics, you always have to bond it to the surface of the tooth. So you always will need resin cements for glass ceramics, which are nothing but feldspathic ceramics as well as Emax and lithium disilicates. Now, let's take a look at the tooth position and the substrates. Now, um, when you're looking for implant crowns, you don't really want to bond the implant crowns to the abutment. You don't want to do that. So then you are looking at a slightly lower bond strength. So you would go in for either conventional GIC or you could go in for an RN GIC. When you're looking at a uh, fiber post bonding, that's where you would want to look for simplicity and ease in the methods. That's where you're going to go in for the self-adhesive resin cement, where you don't need to etch, you don't need to bond. All you do is mix the cement, place it into the canal, place your post and you are done. So that makes your life very simple. Instead of having to etch the canal, bond the canal, then uh, etch and bond the fiber post, and then place. So this, this makes life very, very simple. Now, when you are looking at smaller restorations, like maybe an inlay only or a veneer, where you're going to try and bond it to enamel, there you would need higher bond strength. And that's where you're looking for the adhesive resin cement, which has the maximum bond strength. Also, the type of cement that you should be using depends upon the core material that is there. So is your core built up of composite or it is built up of metal or it is just plain tooth structure over which you are creating a crown that also forms the basis of the cement that you're going to choose. Finally, when you're looking at anterior teeth, you're looking at better aesthetic. So you would rather go in for uh, uh, the more aesthetic resin cement as compared to the opaque GIC and RNGIC cements. Now, in the anteriors, you're looking at more amount of translucency. So having an opaque cement is going to actually block that translucency that you are trying to achieve. Now, when you are using different ceramic materials like silicates, lithium disilicate, or Emax or feldspathic ceramic, you need to uh, etch the intaglio surface of those crowns with hydrofluoric acid and silane. So this is a mandatory step that needs to be done for glass ceramics, irrespective of the cement that you're going to be uh, using, whether it's it's uh, you know of X brand or Y brand or Z brand, or whether it's uh, it's a self-adhesive cement or whether it's an adhesive cement. Irrespective of that, if your material of the restoration is a silicate, lithium disilicate, Emax, any of these materials, you will have to etch the intaglio surface of the restoration with hydrofluoric acid. But when it comes to zirconia crowns and uh, it comes to resin-based materials, you don't need to etch with hydrofluoric acid in those cases. All you need to do is sandblasting of the crown. Uh, most of the times the sandblasting is already done by the lab when they send it across to you. Uh, is it preferable to sandblast a lithium disilicate or an Emax crown? The answer is no, because this is a very delicate, very fragile material. Uh, pushing uh, sand particles onto the surface of the material uh, at pressure, under pressure, could create cracks which could propagate and eventually fracture the material. So the uh, the method of um, pre-treatment is different when you are doing it for zirconia and when you're cementing uh, silicate. Now, um, for a long period of time, I trusted a conventional GIC cementation. I was very, very comfortable uh, with, with this kind of cement. It's a powder and a liquid. So uh, you take one scoop of powder and you take one drop of liquid and uh, you, know, you mix it up, place it in the crown, place it, remove the excess and send the patient away. However, over a period of time, I have come to realize that 
this is never a predictable bond or a predictable technique but the reason for this is that that one drop that we are going to extrude has no basis really i mean your one drop could be double of mine uh, or my one drop could be one third of somebody else's drop so every time you are going to mix gic conventionally you are going to have a different bond strength it's never going to be no two bond strengths are ever going to be the same it's it's just basically guesswork and eventually what you realize is gic tends to dissolve in the uh, saliva and that's where your secondary carry start so while initially it may appear to be successful but probably 5 years down the line you do start seeing signs of uh, gic dissolving and eventually secondary carry starting from there so two challenges here is one is the powder liquid ratio is inconsistent so you usually end up with powder remaining and the liquid getting over and it is also difficult to remove flash this is one of my own very very old cases where i found it very hard to remove the flash after the material had set and i i i click this photo to keep it as a memory so what i have moved towards now are uh, automix and clicker delivery systems uh, the reason for this is that the powder liquid ratio is no longer a challenge uh, here there is a base and catalyst which is already pre proportioned so when i press the clicker there is only the same amount of base and catalyst that's going to come out each and every time so i don't have to worry about is my assistant taking more powder and less liquid uh, uh, is my liquid getting wasted so all of that stress is now gone there is no wastage there is faster mixing and clean up and i have predictable bonds now so i don't uh, worry about uh, my, my patient coming back with the crown in his hand probably two or three years down the line now when you compare the different types of cements when you compare conventional uh, gic cements and uh, self adhesive with resin cements you find that there is difference in the properties so when you look at the adhesion of two two tooth structure you find that conventional cement has low adhesion whereas resin cement has very high uh, moisture tolerance for a conventional cement is much better as compared to a resin cement resistance against solubility in the oral medium this is by far the most most important property of any cement we see that gic is badly lacking it's very low in this case which means that the moment you have placed gic in the mouth it starts to dissolve whereas a resin cement remains in the same state it is not going to dissolve it is not going to uptake water it's just going to remain solid and your crown is going to remain stuck in the same place now when you come to pfm crowns if you are doing pfm crowns uh, the first choice or the choice of material for you should be uh, conventional gic or uh, rm gic which you can see is the in the in 3m series it is the relix lute 2 now the reason why you don't need a stronger cement than this is because your crown itself has good strength so all you need is luting the crown to the tooth you're looking at a, a decent enough bond strength to the tooth you can go ahead and use the self adhesive cementation or adhesive cementation but the material of choice still remains the uh, gic or the rm gic restoration but when you come to inlays onlays or a maryland bridge the focus then shifts to using self adhesive or adhesive cementation the reason being that there these inlays onlays and maryland bridges are not retentive they are depending upon the cementation agent for uh, staying in place now the relix lute 2 i would like you to notice the bond strength that you're getting now with enamel you get a bond strength of about 11 megapascals and with dentine you get about somewhere around 7 megapascals now uh, compared to conventional gic this is definitely higher but i will show you uh, as we go ahead what is the bond strength compared to the resin cements and what is the bond strength that you could achieve so uh, one of the advantages of the relix lute two clickers are that it has the ability to tack cure now tack cure is a beautiful feature that is available in resin cements and uh, in 3m it, it the glue two gives you this uh, uh, this property wherein once you have placed the crown in place and you see this excess coming out 
all you need to do is flash your light cure around this excess for about one to two seconds. Just one to two seconds. And this material becomes initially set. It becomes a wax-like consistency. And you can just peel it off with the um, uh, with a explorer and you can send the patient. So it reduces your appointment time. You don't have to sit and wait for your material to set before you start squeezing it out. Um, also, please note the marginal seal of an RMGIC material is much higher than a conventional GIC. The reason being that there is a resin uh, uh, part that is involved in this, which gives you a much better bond strength as compared to GIC. So marginal seal means that after about 6,000 cycles of uh, thermocycling, wherein the crown is uh, uh, you know, subjected to temperature as well as pH changes, you find a very decent uh, 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 marginal seal, which means that this material is not going to be highly dissolving in the oral fluids. When it comes to zirconia restorations, your choice of material should be self adhesive cementation. Uh, this in the 3M categories is the ReliX U200. Another personal favorite of, of mine, um, I have cemented thousands of crowns with this, uh, with this cement. And zirconia is also my material of choice for most of my crowns. So uh, the U200 is a very faithful partner for uh, cementing or zirconia restorations. Now, uh, if it's a crown and bridge, you go ahead with uh, self-adhesive cementation. That's a U200. Even an inlay only can be cemented with a self-adhesive cement. But when it comes to a zirconia Maryland bridge, then you need to move on to adhesive cementation, which will give you a much stronger bond. Uh, now, why U200 is such a special material? In fact, it, uh, amongst all the cements, this seems to be uh, the most favorite among lots of dentists. The reason for this is the transformation that takes place in the, uh, in the different phases. Now, when the material is injected into the crown and it is placed on the tooth, that is when it is unset, it is hydrophilic, which means it flows around moisture. It is extremely moisture tolerant. But once the material is set, it neutralizes and it becomes completely hydrophobic, which means that once it is set, it neither will dissolve in saliva nor it is going to absorb saliva and other fluids to change its shape. So it becomes very, very stable and it remains like this for several years to go. Uh, the advantage here is that you don't need to etch and bond. So either the tooth nor the, uh, the crown needs to be etched and bonded. So all you need to do is just have mix the cement, place it into the crown. If you're using an automix, this is available in two forms. You have the clicker and the automix. So if you're using the automix, you just need to inject the cement into the crown or the pore space and you just uh, cement, remove the excess, stack cure it and you are done. So it's, it's as simple as, as that. Another very important property of the uh, U200 is its ability to completely neutralize. Now, these self-adhesive resin cements, there are several of them. Um, you, the, the property that they have is they are acidic when they are, uh, when they are used initially. That's why you avoid the etching and the bonding. But what is understood is that it is supposed to become neutral over a period of time. We're going to see a little ahead whether that really happens or not. Another doubt that people have in their mind is, does zirconia really bond to the cements? Uh, most people, most doctors uh, tell me that zirconia cannot be bonded. Uh, uh, there is a small correction there. Zirconia cannot be etched, but it can be bonded. And it bonds phosphates very, very well. So if you have a cement, like a self-adhesive cement, with a component of phosphoric acid or a phosphate monomer, it's going to create a chemical bond with zirconia and that bond is going to be very, very strong. Okay. Now, um, I'm just going to repeat this part again. So, you're going to have a very, very strong bond to phosphate. But what happens to zirconia? When you get it from the lab, it is beautifully sandblasted. The surface seems to be very, very clean. But the moment you put it into the patient's mouth to try the crown out, there are phosphate uh, molecules present in the saliva. Now, when this crown and these open zirconia sites 
come into contact with phosphate of the saliva it gets attracted and these zirconia sites get bonded or blocked by phosphate from the saliva or if you have managed to etch the um, uh, crown the zirconia crown with phosphoric sorry yeah if you've managed to etch the crown with phosphoric acid that would also go and bond with the zirconia sites and that is why it is said that we don't etch zirconia either with hydrofluoric acid or with phosphoric acid we only sandblast the crown now sometimes uh, you know some of the doctors would have a, a sandblasting or chair site sandblaster available in the clinic we see that uh, when the zirconia has been sandblasted, there is almost a 98% increase in the bond strength as compared to a non-sandblasted crown. So you see here that the bond strength, this is with U200, of a non-sandblasted crown is about 22 megapascals, where, whereas with uh, sandblasting, the strength increases to about 45, somewhere around close to 45 megapascals. But most people don't have a chair side sandblaster in their clinic. So what, you, what you're ideally supposed to do is use 50 micrometers of, of uh, uh, aluminum oxide at 1 to 2 bar pressure on the intaglio surface of the crown. But like I said, most people don't have this uh, sandblaster in the clinic. And so uh, there's, there was a uh, you know, challenge to look for an easier solution. And that's when our most commonly used material in the dental clinic, sodium hypochlorite, came into the picture. So instead of sandblasting the crown after the try-in is complete, just wipe the surface of the uh, in, or the intaglio surface of your crown with 5% sodium hypochlorite. Wash that hypochlorite off with water and then your surface is ready to be bonded with the uh, uh, self-adhesive resin cement. Now, when it was tested, it was found that a sandblasted crown, whereas a cleaned uh, zirconia crown with hypochlorite gave you similar bond strengths of almost about 45 megapascals. So this, uh, for, uh, yeah, 43 megapascals. So this is a small tip for all of you. So if you don't have a sandblaster in your clinic and you're cementing zirconia crowns, please do not worry. Just clean the intaglio surface of your crown with uh, hypochlorite, sodium hypochlorite, 5%, and wash it off with water, dry the surface, and then go ahead and cement it with the self-adhesive resin cement. So like I said in the beginning that uh, uh, the advantage of using the uh, self-adhesive resin cements is that you don't need to etch and bond. So it brings down the number of your steps to just five or six. So all you need to do is ensure that your crown is clean, your tooth is clean, just place your material into the uh, prosthesis and cement away. Um, okay, so I want to come back to the point that I was making around, uh, you know, the, uh, the acidity of cements. So most of the self-adhesive resin cements are acidic when we start off and we assume that they become neutral over a period of time and, uh, you know, they would provide stability to the tooth. But there were some tests done and it was found that almost all of the, uh, 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 the self-adhesive resin cements, with the exception of the Relax U200, remained uh, still acidic even after 28 days. Now, what happens to the tooth if it is continuously exposed to an acidic environment? Now, um, I, I, I put this question forward to some dentists and some, some people told me that um, it doesn't matter because the tooth is already non-vital. We we, we've done a root canal and we're going to put a crown over that. And then it got me wondering, okay, maybe it, you, know, you would have no symptoms. Maybe a patient uh, with a vital preparation would come back with post-op sensitivity. But what happens to a non-vital tooth, which is continuously uh, exposed to acid? So that brought about a, a very famous report that came out maybe 20 years ago in the newspaper. There was a gentleman who had placed a human tooth in a glass of cola or Pepsi. And uh, he found that the entire tooth was dissolved within 10 days. Now, Pepsi is very, very acidic. It's about 2.5 uh, pH. Um, 
most of these cement, cements lie between uh, four to six. They are not so acidic, so probably would not see such drastic results. But eventually, when you are exposing your tooth continuously to acid, there is going to be demineralization over a period of time. And that could be one of the reasons for uh, the natural tooth failing over a period. Now, um, this is a small video which uh, shows how you can cement a zirconia crown using a uh, self-adhesive resin cement. So I'm just going to try and uh, play this. Okay, so this is uh, chair side sandblasting that is being done. So if you don't have it, don't worry. Uh, just use sodium hypochlorite. Okay, ensure that the crown surface of the natural tooth is clean. So uh, and just... the video is not playing. Oh. Okay, I think it is getting stuck. Is it playing now? No. What I can see is uh, stuck at 48 seconds. Okay, just let me know if you are able to play, see it now. Are you able to see it now? No. Still no. stuck at that 48 seconds. Okay, then we'll try, we'll try in the end uh, to play it once again. I'll just go back to the presentation. I'll try once again towards the end. Okay, now uh, moving on, um, let's take a look at what do we do if we are making crowns with glass ceramics. So these are uh, more or less Emax restorations. We have to move towards adhesive cementation. So that is when uh, using adhesive cementation becomes more important and uh, adhesive cementation is the strongest bond you would have the maximum bond strength with adhesive cementation so irrespective of whether you're making crowns bridges inlays onlays or veneers you could go ahead and use the same cement now uh, uh, like we discussed before you would have to etch the surface of these glass ceramics with hydrofluoric acid followed by application of silane and then you can place the adhesive cement in place. So here is the step-by-step uh, -step procedure for the Relix Ultimate. Now this is the uh, adhesive cement that's available from 3M. So on the tooth surface, you would need to etch it, wash off the edge, uh, slightly dry the surface of the tooth, apply the single bond universal on the surface of the tooth um, now, this acts as both a bonding agent as well as a silane coupling agent. I'm, I'm just going to give you a little bit of information about this slightly ahead. You uh, cure the, uh, the bonding agent. Now, on the uh, tooth surface, you've already etched it. You applied silane on it. You're going to go ahead and mix the, uh, uh, the ultimate cement, place it into the crown, put it onto the surface of the tooth, light cure it for about one to two seconds and you can peel off all of this excess. Then you go ahead and light cure it for about 20 seconds more and then you can send the patient away. Now these are dual cure cements. The U200 is also a dual cure cement and uh, so irrespective of uh, uh, whether you get light or not, it is still going to cure uh, by self curing as well. Now, um, these uh, uh, adhesive cements have to be extremely color stable. Uh, the reason being that you're using translucent materials uh, like Emacs and uh, glass ceramics and you don't want your cement to get stained over a period of time because of which your restoration starts looking dark. So you want your cement to be extremely color stable and the Rely X uh, ultimate is free of tertiary amines, which gives you excessive uh, stability in terms of color. So these are some tests that have been done where certain materials have been placed into coffee and we found that, um, uh, you know, the, uh, some of these materials turned out to be absolutely color stable. 
Now take a look at the bond strength that you are achieving with these materials. It's definitely above 50 megapascals. So this is the kind of bond strength that you're looking at for glass ceramics because please remember that glass ceramics derive their strength of uh, 300 to 400 megapascals only when it is bonded to the tooth structure. So the stronger the bond of the glass ceramic to the tooth, the stronger is your crown going to be against occlusal forces as well as lateral forces. Now this is another video which I'm going to try and play. Let's see if this is uh, going to play. Dr. Omid, are you able to see this? Yep. Yes, ma'am. Okay. So here, uh, the tooth surface has just been cleaned. Um, and now you're going to see that the surface of the crown, now this is a glass ceramic crown, is being etched with hydrofluoric acid. Try and has been completed. When you, when you wash away the acid, it's important to get rid of the acid uh, completely. Okay, and then you've got to apply silane on the uh, surface of the crown. Uh, silane is important because uh, the bond of glass to resin takes place only in the presence of a silane coupling agent. Now, fortunately, the single bond universal comes incorporated with silane. So you can use it as a bonding agent and you can also use it as a silane coupling agent. So you scrub it onto the tooth for about 20 seconds. Slightly air dry it. And then you don't cure it. So if you notice that it has been left uncured. Now on the surface of the tooth, if it is, if it is an enamel based surface, you're going to edge it. Now here, since it's a crown prep, it's more or less dentine. So uh, the single bond universal is being used in the self edge mode. Now you're just going to dry it and you're going to leave it. You're not going to cure this. The reason for this is that the Relyx Ultimate contains a dual cure activator, which is going to cure this bonding agent as well. So the next thing you're going to do is look at how the clicker works. It's a pre-proportioned uh, base and catalyst. So as much as you require, you just click out. Uh, please note that there is no half click with this material. You're supposed to press the entire click and remove uh, the full amount of basin catalyst that's, that comes out. Please do not do a half click because you tend to uh, uh, spoil the ratio of the base and catalyst. Plus, once you close your cap, you could have the excess half click material flowing out into the um, uh, into the cap and that could contaminate and clog your barrels. Now look at this excess material that is coming out. Now this is what is tack cure. You're just going to, that's it. Just for a second, you've applied your light cure and look at the ease with which you are able to pull off the excess. Go ahead and light cure the remaining surface for about 20 seconds on each side. All right, so okay, uh, moving on, uh, when you come to veneers, which I believe is very, very important and it's very, very technique sensitive, uh, most people have confusions on how to cement veneers to. Uh, the tooth surface. Now there are two options. Either you could use a light cure cement only or you could use the Relyx Ultimate as well to cure uh, to bond your veneers to the tooth. 
the material of choice of course is the uh, reliance veneer because it is a light curable cement so what is the advantage that a light curable cement would give uh, you would be able to bond uh, or cure the cement on command so you, with a dual cure cement you have a very small window of working time till you place the uh, uh, veneer in place and you immediately see that the material starts to set now with veneers it's it's difficult to position them because they are very thin and uh, you know you need some time to ensure that they are seated in the correct position so that's why it makes sense to use a light curable uh, veneer cement only now this again is used in combination with uh, the single bond universal now here also you would have to etch the surface of the tooth now this is because veneers are usually made in enamel so etching is important you rinse it thoroughly for 10 seconds dry the surface of the tooth apply single bond universal air dry it do not light cure then on the intaglio surface of the veneer you are going to etch with hydrofluoric acid followed by application of uh, the single bond universal as a silane coupling agent air dry it do not light cure it then you apply the veneer cement into the uh, uh, intaglio surface place it on the surface of the tooth ensure that it's in the correct spot uh you know you could you could uh, uh, you know just hold it with your applicator tip and then you go ahead and you light cure it for about 30 seconds on uh, each side okay now before i finish i would just like to bring about some uh, or give some information around uh, uh, you know bonding and uh, because these cements also utilize Uh, etching and bonding so where should you be doing a total etch or a selective etch or a self etch is what we want to understand now total etch is a procedure is a conventional procedure where you are going to etch the entire surface of the tooth or the cavity or the restorative surface and you going to wash off the acid and you will apply the adhesive self etch is when the bonding agent itself is acidic so you or uh, negate the use of an etchant you are avoiding the use of the etchant the self etching agent itself contains the uh, etch plus adhesive which you could use the third option is the selective etch wherein you etch only the enamel margins and you rely on the self etching agent to bond both the enamel as well as etch and bond the dentine now all of these methods are to be utilized for different procedures now for a uh, veneers when you're cementing veneers you're more working more or less on enamel so that is where you would want to use the uh, total etch procedure in fact it is recommended to use the total etch procedure for making veneers or cementing veneers when it comes to crowns uh, if say you are doing an emax crown with um, uh, you know with the relax ultimate cement then you can use the self etch technique you know uh, just do a self etching uh, with the single bond universal and apply the uh, uh, ultimate cement in case of inlays onlays overlays and when you have to cement those where you are coming into contact with both enamel as well as dentine and both bonding is important that is where you go in for the selective etch technique wherein the enamel will be etched you going to ensure that the acid etching is performed on the enamel whereas on the dentine you would rely on the uh, self etching bonding agent now the question that you should think about is do you need to invest into all of these different bottles do you need a total etch bonding agent a self etch and a selective etch to do all of these procedures the answer is no now most of these are available in the, the universal bonds they are available from different brands and almost all of them are allowing you to perform the total self and selective etch techniques with the same one bottle only now i am talking about the single bond universal which was one of the first universal bonds to come out in the world and uh, there's a lot of data that has been collected there's a lot of research that has gone on behind it there are more than 300 uh, publications around it now not only for crowns this is not only for cementing crowns you can use it for your regular restorative bonding as well so for all your composite restorations you could go ahead and use this in the very same etching and bonding techniques and this helps you to bond to zirconia um, glass ceramics metal alloys and so on 
Now, the reason why the single bond universal is, is very popular and uh, most people rely on it, uh, people don't move away from the bonding agent is because of the chemistry that comes with it. Uh, this gives you VMS. Now, the V stands for victory bond copolymer. It's a very special patent and molecule that uh, 3M has been able to push into their bonding agents. Now, irrespective of the moisture level in the tooth, you will be able to bond, uh, get the same kind of bond. So if you've over dried your tooth or you've left your tooth moist or the slight amount of saliva contamination, this is going to take care of it. It also contains MDP. So all of you who are doing zirconia restorations, left, right and center, MDP is something which helps you to bond better to zirconia. It improves the bond of zirconia to the resin. And as I have already mentioned, it contains a stable silane, which allows you to negate the use or avoid the use of a separate silane coupling agent. Now, like I said, these give you a good amount of moisture tolerance or uh, even some amount of saliva tolerance. This is a study that has been done for it. And irrespective of the, uh, the edge and the bonding mode that you're using, you find that less than 1% of these restorations come back with post-op sensitivity. So if you've done 100 composite and uh, crown restorations, you would see that less than one of them would come back to you with a post-op sensitivity case. My final bit, I'm just going to take another five minutes uh, is going to be around the importance of light curing. Now we saw that uh, some of these cements have to be light cured. Some of these are dual cured, but they still do rely on some amount of light curing. So uh, does it matter what is the kind of light curing you're going to be using for uh, uh, cementing? Yes, it does. Especially in the case of indirect veneers. Uh, you remember when we showed you the protocol of the Relyx veneer cement, we said that you don't cure the bonding agent on either sides. Uh, now, the reason for that in case of the Relyx veneer is you expect that the light is going to pass through the, uh, the crown, uh, the layer of bonding agent, the cement and then reach the bonding agent on the tooth and cure all of it completely. So for that, you need to have your light in good working condition. It should have a good enough intensity and you should also hold it in a particular direction directly on top of the restoration to ensure that there is through and through bonding. Now, what is being seen that if you have a 0.5 mm restoration, so if the thickness of a wall or say a veneer is 0.5 mm, it cuts down the light transmission by almost 50%. Now, what it what does this mean to your uh, uh, you know your bonding or your restoration? Say you're doing an only, and uh, you know you you light curing it through the uh, only now. If your light intensity is dropping by 50%, you would need to cure that much longer, 50% longer in order to be able to cure the entire cement and the bonding agent completely. So this is something that you need to think about if, if you, if you uh, had attended the session yesterday. Uh, one of the examples that I gave around uh, on lace was uh, recently a friend of mine had complained that uh, her prosthodontist did not want to do onlays because he found that it frequently got debonded. Now, one of the main reasons for debonding could be the intensity of the light cure that is being used when you are placing it in the mouth. So, uh, in summary, for selection of cements, uh, uh, when you are looking for metal ceramic restorations or you are looking at implant crowns, going for the traditional, conventional, or RMGIC. When you're looking at oxide ceramic crowns or glass ceramic crowns with retentive design, then you go in for self-adhesive resin cements. But when you're going for non-retentive designs like inlays, onlays, veneers, overlays, and you're looking at glass ceramics, that's when you go in for adhesive resin cements, which could be either light curable or they could be dual curable. Now, um, how do these crowns or how can we improve the life of these crowns is by asking the patient to maintain, do some amount of maintenance. Now, on the patient's end, we have to tell them to floss. It's very important to floss so that uh, if, even if the margins of your crown are not very perfect, 
the floss would allow uh, the uh, plaque to be moved away it would allow for food lodgement to not allow for food lodgement to be there uh, the other option would be especially in cases where you see a lot of patients coming back to you with dk very frequent dk you could advise them to use the clinpro tooth cream or something like a mousse which would uh, allow you for remineralization of the tooth structure uh, and prevent further caries from start coming on so um, thank you very much for uh, all your patience for the last two days uh, we can now open up the session for question and answers and doubts and clarifications maybe some of you could share your own experiences with us and uh, we could benefit out of all of that so thank you very much once again thank you ma'am for that wonderful extensive presentation any doubts Anyone who is having doubts can unmute themselves and ask. Ma'am, are there zirconia veins available? Uh, since you told uh, that point three mm preparation is enough for aesthetic yes. cases. Yes. So there is a new uh, zirconia material that has come into the market. It's called as Lava Aesthetic or Lava Max. so these are uh, uh, you know they have come in competition to the e max as in they give you better strength but similar aesthetic so they can be used for making veneers uh, another thing that i have found out is that uh, uh, with relix veneer cement yes i have the translucent shade yes but even then after i cure it it's not exactly translucent even if i take it a bit out of on my uh, spoon excavator or something and then i cure it outside it's not it doesn't become translucent it's still a white creamy thing does that affect the end result like making the emax crown a bit more opaque so the uh, shade is translucent it's not transparent so uh, there is a difference i think uh, the uh ivo class cement comes in a transparent shade which is completely see through now this gives you a certain amount of opaqueness in order to mask uh, if there are any uh, discolorations present on the tooth it's going to mask it but in terms of the shade it's not going to change the value of the shade of your uh, uh, restoration okay okay any questions from the audience please free, feel free to ask or you can put it in the chat box and i'll read it how to manage a question has come doctor how to manage contact gaps after a few days of crown fixation uh, okay um the fact that a uh, contact has opened up after a uh, crown has been fixed is probably you haven't noticed it when the crown cementation was going on so one of the steps that uh, you should be doing uh, when you are doing your trial is to place the floss and check how tight the contact is so uh, on both the sides on both the proximal sides you should uh, this should become a habit actually because many times you don't notice that there is an open contact or there is a loose contact and uh, you end up cementing it and after some days the patient is going to come back to you with food lodgement or certain discomfort the reason for that is either the patient is periodontally compromised which is allowing your teeth to move at a very fast rate or the the crown was already having a loose contact right from the beginning uh, the second reason is more common but if it has happened then uh, there's nothing much that you can do uh, you will have to remove the crown and um, if you are able to get it out in one one go it's good if not um, you know you could you'll have to get another one made so what i do is uh, uh, especially for high end crowns what i do is uh, i cement it temporarily for a few days Uh, for the patient to experience it, check contacts, check high points, and only the patient is satisfied. We call them over after a week, ten days, and then cement it permanently. So sometimes we have caught issues like this, which were missed earlier on, and we've been able to rectify it before uh, you know you've cemented it permanently. Uh, 
what temperature cement would you suggest? So uh, I have used the temp any cement for a very long time and it has it has worked completely fine. You could also use IRM. That's also something that I have used extensively. The IRM is also something you could use or you could just make a thick mix of zinc oxide eugenol and use it. But that will also work. react with the uh, adhesive properties. Yes. So that is why uh, if you saw the uh, the video that I was showing, there's a good amount of humusing that is done on the surface of the tooth. And that is to ensure that you're removing all of the uh, uh, temporary cements that you have applied. You're going to get rid of all of it before uh, you're going to apply your resin cement. Can we do inlays and onlays with zirconia? Yes, you can. You can do it. And we would bond it with uh, resin uh, yes. ultimate, right? Yes, ultimate, yes. Anything else, please do come up with the questions. I would also like to take this moment to thank the IDA Malabar branch. Thank you so much for this opportunity to uh, share this experience. Uh, this may seem to be a very basic topic, uh, you know, but most of us struggle in some way or the other when we are doing this uh, crown and bridge preparation. This is bread and butter for all of us. This is where we make our money and uh, um, it's important that we get it perfectly right. So if you follow these steps each and every time, you're going to get the same predictable results. So that's the concept of success simplified, which uh, you know, we are, we are talking about now. So I would request everyone to, uh, you know, uh, I'm, I'm going to share a feedback link. I would request all of you to please take five minutes and fill it up for us. If you haven't done that, uh, you know, yesterday, we just request you to do it today. So just give me a moment. I'm just sharing it. Yes, man, got it. I put it into the WhatsApp group. So I think there are no more questions. Let's wind up from uh, this side of Idea Malabar. Thank you, 3M and Dr. Manikya Arabulu, ma'am, for the, such a wonderful presentation. It was deep insight into the chemistry of 3M and how much research they have put into their products. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you so much. Thanks, doctor. Thanks, everyone, for joining in. We'll end the session.